It is about robust IRC, and yeah, have fun. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? No. Please, please be, be as close as possible to the microphone okay. and, and twist things if they do not fit. Okay. Because when you take your microphone away, you will not hear the speaker anymore. So please, as close as possible. Right. All right, that sounds better. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Michael. I'll be talking about robust RC or RC without net splits. Next slide, please. The motivation to do anything in the IRC space really is that IRC is still widely used among free software and hacker circles. And we looked around and we didn't find a convincing alternative. We then thought about what are our problems with IRC actually. And the biggest problem that we saw is the lack of stability in terms of TCP disconnects. As you know, whenever you have a TCP disconnect between the client and the server, the client will just not be part of the chat anymore. But if you have a TCP disconnect between two servers, that means that entire parts of the network cannot talk to each other anymore. This gives you a perverse incentive of never upgrading software don't doing kernel upgrades, not rebooting your machines, etc., because all of that causes net splits, which you want to avoid, right? Next slide, please. So we had two ideas to fix this. The first idea is that we came up with a tunnel protocol to get rid of the disconnects being a factor at all. And the second idea is that we looked around and saw that there are highly available databases. So why not look at that, use it as a model, and then design an IRC network as a distributed system on top of a library called Raft. Next slide, please. So in a robust IRC network, you have a number of servers, and they make up one single virtual IRC server. At any given point in time, the minority of these servers can fail, and it's not a problem. For example, if you have a network consisting of three servers, one of them can fail. If you have five servers, two of them can fail. For communication between the client, i.e. you or your IRC client, and the robust IRC network, we're using a protocol called Robust Session. It's based on HTTP and JSON, so they can be implemented very easily in clients. There's a very tiny program called The Bridge, which tunnels IRC over Robust Session. So you run that program, and then you connect your IRC client to it, and you're in the IRC network. Next slide, please. So how does it work? Um, every incoming IRC command that we get, we persist using Raft. So that means it will be distributed among all of our servers, and only when the majority of servers has acknowledged it received the message, it will be processed. The servers themselves are implemented as state machines, which means that when they face the same input, they will generate the same state. So that means whenever a client loses connection to any given server, they can just fail over to a different server and continue reading the stream of messages. It also means that whenever your server process dies because you're doing a reboot or whatever, it can just reprocess the state it already has and then be in sync with all of the other computers again. Next slide, please. The fine print is that the IRC latency, i.e. the latency between you sending a message and other people receiving it, will be determined by the median latency of all the servers, just because the message needs to be distributed. Also, if you want to have a really, really robust network, you will have to have access to at least three different failure domains, meaning if you put three different robust IRC servers on the same machine, if the machine dies, you're still host, right? And last but not least, the throughput that we get of around 1,000 messages is not yet high enough to replace the IRC software in the biggest IRC networks like Freenode or RCNet. Next slide, please. So in order to connect, you can just install the robust IRC bridge, which might be in your distribution. For example, if you're using Debian or Arch Linux, you can just install it. If not, you can just install Go, and then you use these commands shown on the slide. You set up a Go environment, you download and install our code, you run it, and then you can connect your favorite IRC client to localhost, and you're in. You could also use a, a bridge that we provide, which is called legacy IRC dot and then the network name. It's not as good in the sense that it will only guard against net splits between the servers, but obviously not be between the connection between you and the bridge, right? Next slide, please. This is the end of the lightning talk, but there's more. If you want to know more, check out robustirc.net. There's an admin guide if you want to set up your own network. There's also a 40-minute tech talk if you want to learn more about the details. And also, I'm at this conference, so please do feel free to grab me anytime and talk to me. I'd love to discuss this further with you. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention. We have still a minute left for questions. You were much, much too fast. Are there any questions? No, 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 I don't see any. So please, the next speaker, come up. OK. Yeah, hi, I'm Max. And uh, I will show you a project which I worked on with a few friends from Darmstadt. 
and it's NFC gate, uh, breaking NFC for fun and obviously security. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a quick NFC primer. You probably all know NFC, near field communication. It's a wireless protocol, runs at around 13.56 uh, megahertz. Um, it uses smart cards, which are powered by the reader. It's used for payments, public transport, ID documents, and uh, there are NFC chips in almost every Android telephone. Next slide, please. So when we saw that there is a new feature with Android 4.4, which is called host card emulation, uh, we were pretty excited because that meant that you can actually use an Android phone and emulate uh, an NFC card to a reader. Next slide, please. So in theory, you just need a card, you need two Android phones, you need a reader, and you can just relay all the traffic and have fun, inspected the whole shebang. So in practice, next slide please, um, we found that Android really doesn't want you to do that. So it puts up a lot of walls, and then there are also a number of bugs. So it was uh, quite a bit of pain involved. Next slide please. Um, but with a lot of time, a lot of cursing, and a lot of coffee, in the end we managed to circumvent all those problems. And we're going to tell you about it now. Next slide please. Uh, the first problem was that Android only supports a specific ISO standards for HCE. And many systems do not use this ISO standard, so you could not emulate them. Um, we solved this problem by uh, going into the Android HCE code and the A NFC native code libraries and just remove all those checks. And we did this in a way uh, which uh, allows you to run our code without patching your Android. So you can just take your stock Android, install Exposed, install our app, and it'll work. Uh, so now we can emulate pretty much all popular NFC cards, except for MyFair Classic, but MyFair Classic has been broken for years, so who cares? Next slide, please. Um, the second problem is that um, Android has no API which allows you to set the unique identifier of the card you are emulating. So it'll always use a random unique identifier and this is annoying because this is usually used at least in some part of your authentication protocol. Um, we fixed that by finding an undocumented function in the libNFC which allowed us to pass a byte stream to the NFC chip and with that byte stream, we could set an arbitrary UID and some other values which are also relevant to NFC. We can thus now emulate any arbitrary UID. So if your door lock only uses a UID to authenticate the card, you now have a problem. Next slide, please. Um, requirements for running our code is a device running Android 4.4 or upwards. Um, you need at least one device with a Broadcom NFC chip because the NXP chips uh, do not have the specific set config function. Um, but for example, Nexus 4 will work just fine. You need the exposed framework installed. You need a server to run the relay server on. We will probably implement some sort of direct connection at some point. And you need an NFC system to test, obviously. Next slide, please. So why are we releasing it? This stuff is dangerous, right? Um, well, for us, it's basically Kirchhoff. Um, so if your, the security of your system relies on uh, the well, confidentiality of the data you're sending, you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, so fix your shitty security or people are going to break your stuff. Next slide, please. So you can get the code at nfc.wtf. Um, you can get a pre-compiled APK. You can get the full source code. It's licensed Apache. And um, yeah, have fun, break stuff, send patches if you want. And you can reach us at gate at nfc.wtf or talk to me at the camp. Any questions? No? Great. Thank you very much. Hello, my name's Katie and I work at the British Library. And you might be thinking, what on earth is a librarian doing here talking about labs? You know, there's one librarian in the room who's excited. I hope to convince some of you that actually there's a lot more to libraries these days than dead trees. And that's, 
not to say we don't have quite a lot of dead trees. The British Library's got 150 million books and manuscripts and sound recordings, maps, you name it. And we also have an archive of the entire UK internet domain. So we're a bit more digital than we might first seem when you think about us in terms of rows of books. But the British Library Labs project is about looking at what we can do with our digital and our digitized collections. Because like every library, we're digitizing a lot of our material. But we believe that that's just the beginning. You can pump out content, but it's what people do with it that really matters. So next slide, please. So what is Labs and how does it work? And fundamentally, what it's about is two things. It's about people with interesting ideas and it's about data. And the people with interesting ideas can be anybody. They could be you, they could be somebody in an academic job, they could be somebody who works for a tech startup who sees our data as useful. And it's sometimes us as well. We sometimes have ideas for what we might be able to do with a bit of know-how and some experimentation. So you can see on the diagram here that there's a sort of stage where we sort of work out what the best ideas are. And some of that stage happens without any involvement from the library at all. What we love best is when people come up with ideas that we hadn't even begun to think of. But there's a team in the library that support working with our data, that help people access data and work with it in whatever way they want to. Next slide. And there's two main things that might be of interest to people here. One is the competition, which is if you do something cool with the data that we're making available, tell us about it and there are prizes. And the other is if you have a really good idea, there are awards which can help fund the development of a really interesting idea based on our data. Next, please. So speaking of this data, it's very old, but I've brought a hard drive with me. There's nearly two terabytes of data on this thing. I haven't been organized enough to put it up anywhere online, but it's yours for the taking if you want it. Not the hard drive, but the data. On here, there's something like um, a million images or so, 70,000 of them tagged. There's OCR data. There's all sorts of things to play with, all released public domain for anything you like. Next, please. And it's a messy set of data. I don't make any claims to this being easy or, you know, neatly set out, but there's masses here to play with. Next, please. And one more thing I just wanted to suggest, perhaps, which is a challenge that we're facing in the library at the moment, just to throw out there, really, to see if anybody here fancies taking it on as a challenge. And that is, we still have tens of thousands of books, maybe even hundreds of thousands, catalogued on old catalogue cards, like this, which every librarian knows and hates. And we've got a crowdsourcing site where people are gradually converting those to electronic records for us. But that still involves people. And these are cards which have a standard layout and standard information on them. And so we think there might be a way of using a kind of combination of machine learning, computer vision to do this automatically. So I'd be really excited to talk to anybody who thinks they can do that. Next slide. And whether or not you fancy talking to me about it, all the data from that crowdsourcing experiment is available for download for free on the website. So have a play around with that if it's your kind of thing. Next. So this last slide is really um, to end by saying see you next time. Not here, obviously, not next year because this isn't happening, but I'll be at EMF camp in the UK and I'd love to see some of you there with crazy things you've made with the British Library's data. What you're seeing on the slide is an art piece that was at Burning Man last year, done by an American artist who used some of the images that are on this hard drive to create this big art piece, this illuminated piece. And we loved it so much, it's now on display at the British Library in London, on the roof of the storage building where the books it was digitized from are housed. Thank you. Are there any questions, whether library nerd or otherwise? Sorry? The question is, the website seems to be offline. When will it be online again? I'll investigate. It shouldn't be offline, but I'll get onto the IT guys after I get off stage. Thank you. Next up is uh, RKA talking about Saft am Sonntag in Berlin.
Genau, zur Abwechslung mal auf Deutsch, weil es ein ähm, Berliner Problem ist, aber ihr ähm, könnt ja auch sie, euch einwählen für die englische Version. Ähm, worum geht's? In Berlin gibt es Spätis, da gibt es Treibstoff, gerade für Hacker. Ähm, Club Mate gibt es dort in jedem, allerdings schließen immer mehr, weil sie offiziell sonntags nicht öffnen dürfen. Da gab es auch eine Diskussion, äh, beziehungsweise eine ähm, Petition, die gestartet wurde, ähm, die auch sehr zu unterstützen ist. Allerdings bezweifle ich, dass die ähm, Politiker und meine Kollegen dort tatsächlich für eine Änderung auch ähm, gesetzlicher Art sorgen, wobei das auch schwierig ist, weil es eben ein entsprechendes Urteil auch mal gab vom ähm, Bundesverfassungsgericht, welches ein liberales Ladenöffnungsgesetz in Berlin, was auch Sonntagsöffnungen erlaubte, untersagt hat. Deswegen habe ich mich gefragt, warum dürfen Spätis eigentlich nicht das, was Tankstellen dürfen? Habe ich ins Gesetz geguckt, Berliner Ladenöffnungsgesetz, da steht drin, muss Betriebsstoff verkaufen dachte ich mir, welchen Betriebsstoff kann denn ähm, ein Späti verkaufen? Mate zählt noch nicht dafür, Fahrzeuge gibt es noch nicht, die man damit fahren. Allerdings äh, kann da Strom sein. Mit Strom fahren Fahrzeuge und jeder Späti hat Strom. Insofern ähm, gibt es die Möglichkeit tatsächlich, dass ähm, Spätis Strom als Betriebsstoff verkaufen. Es gab dazu tatsächlich auch schon mal ein Urteil in Dresden, von 2001, wo es eine ähnliche Situation gab, dass dort 1999 vier Stromtankstellen eröffnet haben, es insgesamt dort im Bereich 21 Elektrofahrzeuge gab, die damit ähm, betankt und betrieben werden sollten. Die größte Kundschaft hatten die Stromtankstellen aber wegen ihrem Reisebedarf und weil sie den eben auch sonntags verkaufen durften. Ähm, deswegen ist meine oder mein Projekt ähm, tatsächlich dafür zu sorgen, den Spätebetreibern eine einfache Möglichkeit zu geben, Betriebsstoff Strom zum Beispiel auch für Pedelecs, E-Bikes etc. zu anzubieten. Das geht mit einem ganz einfachen Lösung, nämlich irgendeinem Ladegerät für irgendein E-Bike oder ein Pedelec ähm, bis zu einem Multifunktionsladegerät, wie es an touristischen E-Bike- und Pedelec-Strecken ähm, angeboten wird, ähm, welches jedes Modell laden kann und ähm, ich würde mich freuen, wenn sich doch vielleicht der ein oder andere aus Berlin auch findet, der ähm, das Projekt mit unterstützen möchte und Interesse daran hat, ähm, es den Spätibetreibern möglichst einfach zu machen, auch rechtssicher am Sonntag und rund um die Uhr öffnen zu können. Ähm, bisher ist es, wie gesagt, aufgrund der ähm, gesetzlichen Lage und dass sie offiziell keine Tankstellen sind, nicht möglich. Ähm, dann habe ich jetzt, glaube ich, noch Zeit für Fragen. Vielleicht gibt es die eine oder andere. Schreien oder zum Mikrofon. Das sehe ich nicht. Ihr ähm, findet mich hier auf jeden Fall im Wiki unter RKA, wo es auch die ähm, aktuellen Folien gibt, die es leider nicht mehr auf den Screen geschafft haben. Ähm, und ihr könnt mich erreichen unter dem Deck ähm, 2287. I believe there's a question there in the audience. Es gibt in Neukölln einen Polizisten, der sich dort ähm, relativ scharf aufspielt und ähm, sozusagen da viele Verfahren in Gang setzt, weswegen der Bezirk besonders betroffen ist. In anderen Bezirken gibt es teilweise ähm, Blockwarte oder andere, die da auch ein Problem mit haben. Ich bin der Meinung, dass ähm, jeder Spätibetreiber, der selbstständig ist, selber entscheiden sollte, wann er sein Geschäft betreiben möchte, wenn dies gerade auch Tankstellenbetreibern und großen Ketten erlaubt ist. Yeah, we have still time for one more question, I think. Na, also es kann, äh, wenn man die Tankmöglichkeit tatsächlich im Laden äh, anbietet, dann ist es nicht so. Das kann sein, dass man eben den Akku entweder hineinträgt oder dass man das tatsächlich noch eine ähm, kleine Ecke für ein ähm, äh, Fahrrad hat, wo man das zum Beispiel abstellt. Ansonsten ist es natürlich immer unterschiedlich der jeweiligen ähm, vor, ähm, Umgebung. Ich allerdings setz, finde die Lösung am interessantesten, wo man überhaupt keine ähm, äh, Sonderstraßennutzung oder ähnliches beantragen muss. Gut, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Next up will be a 3DS man talking about open embroiderer. 
And uh, just uh, one thing before you uh, start with the talk. Uh, if you get questions, this to every speaker, please try to repeat them. Unfortunately, we have uh, no microphone angels and no signal angels for this talk. And so people in the stream also want to uh, hear the question. So please leave us time to repeat the question or repeat the question yourself. Oh. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sebastian from uh, Electrolab, a French hackerspace near Paris. And I would like to introduce you our project of open source embroidery machine. Um, so, please, next. Um, we, we would like to make a cheap, simple, and non destructive machine. Okay. So, uh, So, uh, for that, we, we would like to, excuse me, we would like to make it easy to set up and reverse to be acceptable for most people. Uh, next one. Uh, the most uh, embroidery machines are very expensive, uh, $1,000, euros, and uh, Sewing machines are only 100 euros, so next one. Uh, before to start uh, this project, we are looking for other solutions. So uh, there's not very much solution. There's only six uh, embroidering machines we found on the internet and only two documented. Next. Uh, there's a lot of uh, software, but from vendors. And what the difference between a sewing machine and a embroidery machine? Next. There's an XY table, a needle position sensor to know whenever we can move, and a speed, con a speed control. So we're gonna must emulate it. Uh, the X table, XY table uh, work, needle position we have, but the speed control we can't uh, emulate it for the moment, but we are working on. Uh, so the software, uh, there are some solution, but not open source, so we must make our own. Next one. Um, Today, we have this uh, machine that works uh, pretty well. Uh, there's some sample we did yesterday with it here. Um, and we're working on the software because there are a lot of work. Uh, and we're working on a new foot uh, to all the fabric during the process that's going to uh, um, improve the, the result. So if you want to see the machine uh, in work, uh, you can come uh, at the French Abbassi uh, tonight uh, at 8 p.m. We're going to make a little demo. Any questions? I don't see any, then thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is VP Vrek, talking about Neo 900. Good afternoon, my name is Van Almisberg. I'm um, presenting on behalf of the Neo 900 project, and I'm going to talk about modem security from a uh, hardware point of view, um, <clears throat> what can be improved. So this, uh, this shows what your modem looks like, um, I mean what your system looks like on your smartphone. On one side you have your uh, application processor, which typically runs Linux, it's nice and open, something you can trust. On the other side you have the world of the uh, telephony protocols, your modem, where everything is closed even required by regulation to be closed, and you cannot quite trust it to do what you actually want it to do. But um, 
still this looks kind of reasonable. I mean, you for, for the good things on one side, the bad things, the potential bad, th potentially bad things on the other side. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, in reality, it's a bit different because the modem side grabs deeply into the, um, the application uh, processor side. So there can be, for instance, shared memory, there can be binary drivers that are required to operate your telephony part, and so on. So in reality, you're not really safe from what's going on on the, tele on the telephony side. Next, please. Now, we can, of course, recreate the separation. We can put uh, the modem into a separate um, part of the circuit and let it talk to your main CPU only over USB, for instance, or some other serial interface and supply it with power. And then again, they're nicely separated, right? Next, please. Unfortunately, well, let's have a first look at what your modem looks like. Um, I mean, it's not just a modem. It has sensors, for instance, a microphone, and it also has the radio interface. It has an antenna. And next, please. Now with this, of course, it can autonomously uh, establish a communication link. It can listen and send it out. And it doesn't, even, doesn't have to tell the CPU anything about this because the CPU is not involved in this. And next, please. So this means that your CPU, uh, well, first of all, your modem can do this behind your back. And the CPU has no means of even detecting that it is doing something behind, behind your back. Now this is bad. Next, please. Fortunately, we can do something about this. We can, for instance, move the modem on the other side, move it, move it to the CPU, so that um, when the modem wants to listen, it has to ask the CPU for permission to get uh, the data stream. So this is nice, but we can do better. Next, please. We can observe what the modem is doing. So we can basically start watching the watchers. We can uh, monitor what current is co it is consuming. We can monitor when it is emitting a clock for getting audio data. We can monitor what is going on on the antenna interface, if there's a, if there's a signal or not. So there we can, we can detect when the modem is doing something, and then we can see, does it make sense for the modem to be doing something at the moment? For instance, if it is receiving a call, then, it would, then you would expect to see some activity, and shortly thereafter, there would be a call. Now, if there's activity and nothing, maybe you were, you were just being served on a silent SMS. But with this kind of things, we can do a profiling and detect this kind of stuff. Uh, but sometimes, this is not enough. You try, you're not happy with just detecting when bad things happen, though sometimes it's the, good, it's the right thing because you might respond in a different way to this. For example, if you're going to a conspirative meeting, so when you detect, oh, they're tracking me, then you say, oh, no, no, I'm not going to the conspirative meeting. I'll, I'll go to the supermarket. And, but you do not, nothing suspicious. But sometimes you just want to turn it off. Next, please. And so we can also just cut power. Now, of course, there's a lot more to a, to a smartphone. Next, please. And here you can see some more details. And in the New 100 project, we are building um, a smartphone that has these uh, security features on the modem side, plus all the rest you see in here. Uh, next, please. And if you want to know more, you can come over to our village, which is just in this direction um, across the street, the new, the new village. Or you can also come to a longer talk that is tomorrow at uh, 15 o'clock at C-based uh, workspace tent. Okay, I still have time for questions, if there are any. No questions? Then thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The next There's talk currently no speaker behind here, so to all speakers, come in front, look up and evict you when it's your time to talk and just be right here uh, before the talk start. So who's the next speaker? The next speaker should be RFDS Labs talking about Mimosa Right Router, a feature in Cisco Routers. Are you here, please? Come up and speak. Has anyone seen RFDS Labs? If no, okay, I don't so, see so anybody, then, we then we'll skip go that over one. over to the next one, I think, and uh, until he or she is ready, I will have to do a short announcement. Is this okay? So who's next? It's uh, Sprudel from the Hobelschlunzen village talking about speed dating, and she's already there, but you can make your announcement, I believe. Yeah, I uh, got a short message from the third, and I will repeat this message also after the talks, because it's concerning your safety and security. <laughs> so it's a public service announcement, and I will do it in German and in English. And uh, uh, the third wants to uh, keep you informed that the weather mm -hmm. forecast indicates that 
thunderstorm starting tonight or tomorrow noon, somewhere in between, you know how it is with weather forecasts. And it will probably be in this region. I don't know how severe it will be, but anyway, please make sure that your tents are properly fixed, that they are not blown around and hurt people or get damaged or something like this. And all your cables, all your electricity are prepared for rain. So the people providing power will be very happy if they don't, do not have to come to your place and uh, to fix your cable. And uh, anyway, please keep also all pathways, all exits and so on, uh, clear of strings and cables, so if people want to move or, or if there's something happening, so that nobody uh, will trip around over a cable or something like, like this. And please also close your tents to avoid damage. So it might or might not, not, not be a thunderstorm between uh, tomorrow, uh, between tonight and tomorrow noon. And this is in German. Uh, a public service announcement. Also, uh, das CERT möchte euch darüber informieren, dass wir halt einen Wetterbericht haben, der sagt, dass es zwischen heute Nacht und morgen früh ein Gewitter in der Region geben sollte. Es soll anstehen. Bitte schaut, dass eure Zelte äh, richtig abgespannt sind, dass alles zu ist, dass alles geschlossen ist, dass nichts durch die Gegend fliegt, dass äh, alle Kabel fix, äh, festgemacht sind, dass eure Sch äh, Steckdosen nicht volllaufen können, sodass es keinen Kurzschluss und dergleichen gibt und äh, dass alles trocken und regensicher verlegt ist. Haltet bitte alle Wege frei. Also schaut nochmal auf alle öffentlichen Wege und dergleichen, dass dort keine Kabel, Strippen, Schnüre oder dergleichen liegen, wo man stolpern könnte, falls man doch mal halt irgendwo hinschnell muss oder wenn, dass die halt vom Matsch nicht zugeschwemmt werden und keine Gefahr darstellen. Und schließt eure Zelte, damit ihr im Trockenen schlafen könnt. So, and now to the next speaker, please. Thank you for your public safety announcement. And the next lightning speaker will be Sprudel from the Hobelschlunzen village talking about uh, speed dating. Hello, everyone. I, uh, together with Er Lehmann and Plom Lom Plom, Plom Pom, uh, invented a different kind of speed dating. Next, please. So, usually, when you do speed dating, you do it for reasons such as finding a romantic partner or sometimes even to get a job. Um, but the problem is that one half of the participants dates the other half. For example, all the straight men date all the straight women or all the employers date the employees, which is kind of boring. If you put in the effort, why not do some more? Do it less hierarchical and give more than one possibility to the people who meet each other next. Um, so this is what we try to do. We try to improve it and we made up an algorithm by which every participant meets every participant. So no two groups, but everyone gets to meet everyone. And also there are more possibilities on how to, how to um, talk with each other after uh, the actual speed dating. Next, please. What happens at our speed dating sessions is that you will meet in groups of two. After five minutes, you move to the next spot, make your, uh, make your notes on what you want to do with the person next, and then you repeat these steps until you have met everyone, then you hang out a bit and wait for the results next. So this is one of the forms that participants get. Um, it is uh, made up with software um, that you can see uh, on the bottom how to get it. And we, um, we come up with it depending on the numbers of participants. Um, they have instructions which you don't see here, but which I told you. And there you have the ratings where you can say if you want to work with a person you just met. So if you're a straight man meeting another straight man, whatever, you can just work together. Um, you can say that you want to get to know each other better, that you want to cuddle with each other, or, uh, and this is an interesting thing, sorry, um, if you're a bit sensitive to um, sex and sexuality, uh, maybe you want to uh, step outside, uh, because uh, you can also, of course, cross out that you might want to um, do sexual stuff with each other. And then we also have this wild card, which is the last one, where you can just put in a message that will be delivered. The four things beforehand will only be communicated if they are mutual. So only if I want to work with you and you want to work with me, we will actually um, know it. Next, please. 
Um, this is a form that is supposed to tell us how the people are actually moving because this is a bit more complicated in order to move everyone around, have everyone meet exactly one time, um, we need this form. If you are really good in maths, you can help us make this better because what you see here uh, sadly is wrong. <laughs> Next, please. And this is an evaluation form that we use to note down the mutual interests. Um, one horizontal strip will be cut out and will be given to the person with the number. Next, please. So what could possibly go wrong? As you have seen on the forms, um, there are only numbers. We optimized right now for maximum paranoia of participants. So uh, maximum privacy, um, if you forget your number, well, <laughs> that's a problem, um, for example. Um, but this is supposed to help with shyness. Um, and yeah, also, uh, next please. For future, um, we would like to uh, identify bigger groups than just pairs of people who share interests. So we call it orgy identification. Um, if we have four people that all would like to work with each other or all cuddle with each other, whatever, then we would like to tell them. But the way we're doing it right now, we can. So if you want to help us, please do. Next, please. Um, this is where you can do it every day from half past one until half past three. Yesterday we had 10 participants, today it was 20. So let's see if we can get 40 tomorrow. <laughs> um, yes, if you would like to help us also organize it because it's growing, um, we are very helpful and grateful. Any questions? Just ask your question and we'll repeat it. What you saw was um, from top to bottom was uh, just the number of the other participants you could meet. So the forms I showed you were for a group of six participants. And in the horizontal line, there are the possibilities you may choose from. And of course, you may also choose everyone. If you, if you find someone to work with, get to know better, cuddle with, and have sex with, uh, go ahead, cross it out, and then feel met. Thank you very much, Sprudel. And I'd like to repeat an announcement for all the future Lightning Talk speakers. When you get asked questions in the end, please either repeat the question yourself so that the people who watch the stream can hear it, or let us repeat the question. Thank you for that. OK, next up will be Metaplinius. That is you. Yeah. Great, talking about mechanical logic gates. Yes. OK. Um, Electronic logic gates are found uh, in many places today. I hope you know them because I won't have time to explain here. But uh, the question is, can you also build okay. can you also build logic gates out of mechanical elements? Uh, next slide. Um, the uh, concept that I'll be showing you was invented in the 1930s by the engineer Konrad Suse. Next slide who wanted to build a, a kind of uh, automated calculating machine. Um, and he decided to build it out of um, cut out sheet metal. So that's at a time when no computer had been built yet. And the result looked like uh, this. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, it said eins. And you might call it one of the first computers to be ever built. And it was completely mechanical, except for the motor. So when you want to build a, a mechanical computer, you need mechanical gates. And so. Um, that's uh, so how you do that. Um, on the screen, you can see uh, on the right side, left side, a, a green clock input gate and a blue output gate. And when I push in the clock input, because exact, they are connected by a black pin, uh, the output uh, gets pushed in as well, uh, gets pushed out as well, or goes to one, what, whatever terminology you want to do. Um, if, you, if I do not want to uh, get the output pushed out when I push the clock, I can add a little cutout. Next slide. And so this time, when I push in, the output uh, will stay zero. zero. 
If I want to make sure that the output doesn't move, I can add uh, a, a red ground plane that fixes the output. So basically, uh, the idea behind this is I get the right output when I push in the clock, right? The first one was one, the second one was zero. So now for a gate, I want to be able to switch between the two. And so um, we extend this into another dimension. The pin can now have two positions, zero and one. If it's in zero and I do the clock, you've seen it, nothing happens to the output. If it's in the one state, you can see uh, I've cut out the ground plane here. So uh, this time when, when I push in, the output goes to one as well. Um, so uh, if you know gates, that's basically a buffer, right? We want to do something more complicated for an AND gate. So a gate that is uh, outputs only one of both of the... Oh, sorry, I forgot the slide. Yes, so to move the pin, we can add uh, this orange input gate here, and that basically um, copies the movement of the clock, right? Pushed in is one and uh, pulled out is zero. So for an end gate, we have two inputs, and only if both are one, the output is one, two. So let's start with the, with the second input. We know if that's zero, the output can't be one, so we can tie it straight to ground here. If it is one, um, it all depends on the first input. So we add this uh, blue intermediate. Okay. okay. So we... Oh. <laughs> Okay, so we add this blue uh, intermediary plate, and that that depends on the first input. So when the second one is one, and the first one is zero, the output will be zero, so it shouldn't move. And when the first input is one, and the second input is one, the output should be one, as I just said, and so it should move. So what we need to the left there um, is an, is another buffer. Uh, I think I'm, I'm pretty close to the end now. So if you want to look at this again, I've uploaded these slides in SVG format, so you can play around with that. Um, I've also built a physical version, which I don't have enough time to, to uh, say more about here. But uh, I've put up the files for that, if you want to build that yourself. Um, to read more about that, uh, next slide. The Z1, so the first that uh, computer that you saw, backcourt information comes from Sousa's uh, autobiography that uh, that is written there. Uh, next slide. The technical information is from Sousa's patterns for the Z1. Uh, a few ones I have linked there, and also a paper that describes the uh, Z1's computer architecture and gives also an English description um, of the of the gate functioning. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> so. Thank you, Metaplenius. Next up will be Hanno talking about safer C with address sanitization. Sanita sanita yeah, he'll tell you. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, a lot of the code we use each day is written in C, and that's basically not good because C is full of security vulnerabilities, but there are some things we can do to make it a bit better. Um, next page. Um, here's a bit of code. Uh, I hope everyone sees the flaw in it. So we have an array with two elements, and we're accessing element two, which doesn't exist because C starts counting by zero. So there's an element zero and an element one, but an element two that doesn't exist. But the problem is this code will usually just run, and it's hard to find these kinds of bugs. Uh, next page. Um, and there's a very nice feature that's called address sanitizer. It's part of GCC and CLang. Uh, and everyone who is writing any code in C, I mean, you shouldn't write code in C, but if you do it anyway, you should know address sanitizer to test your code, and you can use it for fuzzing, and uh, but also just test the normal operation of your code. Uh, like, uh, for example, I tested the compiling bash with address sanitizer, and just by running it and using it, uh, it found bugs in it where it was accessing invalid memory. Um, next. Um, the problem is I cannot read that, uh, so I have to guess what's on the slide. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you can find bugs like use after free or buffer overflows uh, that very often 
don't crash your application if you compile it normally. And address sanitizer will give you a very nice error message what went wrong and why it has accessed any wrong memory. I think next. <laughs> Uh, and what I tried to do was building a complete uh, Linux system with address sanitizer based on Gentoo, but uh, it's basically just Gentoo because I'm used to it. You can do this with any system. And uh, why would you want to do that? Uh, just doing that will uncover a lot of bugs. Uh, but you could also imagine like using this in production to say, like, really, I want a really safe version of a Linux system and then build everything with address sanitizer. Probably in next slide. <laughs> Um, it has performance costs, which is uh, about 50 to 100 percent, so this is a lot, it's a lot slower, but it's still much better than everything alike that we had before. So yeah, it's an amazing tool, I want more people to use it. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff or interested in fuzzing, like I do a lot of fuzzing right now, uh, then come to me, talk to me, uh, yeah, uh, I want to create safer, more secure, uh, free software operating systems, yeah. <laughs> Any questions? I don't see any, then thank you very much, Hanno. Thank you. So, so before we come to the next speaker, we, we have just a minute here. Um, Unfortunately, we cannot bring the monitor closer to you, to the speaker. But, but however, if you cannot read your own slides from this distance, yeah. your audience also might have some problems reading the slides. So uh, if you are a speaker and want to have your lightning talk tomorrow or on day four, we still have uh, slots left, I think, some. Uh, prepare your slides in a way that yourself can read it from about this distance, so also your audience will be able to read them. Yeah, another, um, or I'll repeat the announcement for the new audience. If you like what you see, or if you don't like what you see, please still submit lightning talks. We have a lot of free slots tomorrow and the day after that, and it's really easy. You just need to hand in a PDF of your slides, send it to us. Um, you will find all the instructions on the wiki. Just look for, uh, search for lightning talks, and we like to have talks about what you're doing at your hackspace, what you're doing at home, what you're doing in politics, any kind of small project that you want to pitch to a large audience in five minutes. Please submit a talk about it. And if you play a musical instrument, you can come on stage. All you need is just one slide. This is the absolute minimum you have to have. We have one slide, one image here to show for you and then you can do whatever you want. You can talk freely, you can play any instrument you like. We, we had some people last year at the Congress doing some music here, it was quite amazing. Poetry, everything is possible. And next up is uh, something else that's obviously a possibility, namely you talking about Tails. Yeah, so hi. Um, I work on Tails, uh, like many other people do, uh, especially in the Debian community. Um, and I want to hear, kind of like debunk some myths and kind of like um, uh, ask for some help because we really need a lot of help to make Tails as safe as possible. Next slide, please. So yeah, we have to debunk some myths because there's been things written about Tails that are not exactly true. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, we are totally not NSA proof. Uh, I don't know why people think this, um, but we want to say that we are not, just to kind of like get this out of the community at all. Uh, Tails actually need a lot of hardening work, uh, especially Debian as well, in order to be um, a lot safer and in order to make it a lot more cost effective uh, for the NSA to, or other 5i partners, for example, um, to try to exploit Tails. Um, and this is something that is going to take a lot of years and a lot of hard work from a lot of community members. Uh, next slide, please. And also, we are really real people. Um, some people think that we are all anonymous, but there's a bunch of people of us here right now at the CCC camp. So if you ever have any questions about Tails that you would really like to get answered, whether that's technical or whether you just want to ask questions about translations or how you can contribute in any way, uh, please find me after the talk and I'm available to answer any question possible as best as I can answer. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to that, 
we really need your help with lots of various stuff. So if you are, if you at some point maybe even want to get paid to do some stuff for Tails, that is possible. Uh, we have a diverse range of things that we really like to get fixed. Uh, next slide, please. So examples of those are, for example, if you're really good in security stuff and know your way around a Linux system, especially Debian, we could really use some, uh, we could really use some eyes on um, some hardening stuff that we could use, for example, for Debian packages, especially um, some things that we ship uh, at the moment. And also, if you contribute to Tails, you contribute to Debian, so we make everything safer in one go. Excellent. So in addition to that, if you're really good uh, with other things, we could also really use your help. Um, if you're really good in translations, especially in languages like Spanish, Portuguese, um, or some other language that you would really like to see that, till, that we are going to support, please help us out. Um, if you really are good in programming on Windows um, or on Mac, we could really use your help with a multi-platform installer so we could make it super easy for journalists to start using Tails, especially on Mac and on Windows. That would be super great and you would get a lot of love from a lot of different persons around the world. In addition to that, reproducible builds in Debian, uh, if we get to that uh, at some point, which we are getting really close to or it's already done, then we do the same thing for Tails, which is excellent. In addition to that, if you're are really want, if you really want to see Tails using GR security for the kernel, please make it happen. Please package this for Debian. Please start a team in Debian to maintain this kernel, and you will get a lot of love from a lot of people around the world, especially here. And then next to us, um, if you want to get stuff implemented within Tails, for example, Tejo Labs or uh, some other crazy security new feature or whatever, please talk, us, please talk to us early so we can see how we could integrate it within uh, Tails. And then from that moment on, Everything is going to be better, and everyone is going to be safer around the world. Um, with that, next slide, please. Um, so if you are here and you want to talk to us about Tails, we are here for the next of the event. Um, if you want to know more about the roadmap that we have for next year, please come to the session tomorrow, which you can find on the wiki, I think. It starts at 6 o'clock, and it's in the Hack Center number one, and we can talk and we can talk about the roadmap that we have for next year. We could really use your input about this stuff and we, so we can make deals better and greater and things like that. All right, thank you. Thank you. We still might have time for one question. A question for a Tails developer. Um, so the question is, are there any questions, are there any things to integrate the, the mempo kernel? Um, if you want to make that possible, please come talk to us after. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Next up will be Oz talking about something with cookies and phone numbers. Hello, everybody. Thanks. OK, maybe somebody of you know about Verdon US spying uh, about your mobile phone, or better, injecting something that can uh, help uh, people to trace, trace you when you visit their website. Electronic Frontier Foundation made a lot uh, of uh, web pages speaking about that. Unfortunately, we have almost the same problem in Italy and might be also in your country. Next slide, uh, please. Uh, so the, we have the problem that when you use your mobile phone using an uh, Italian mobile operator, your uh, mobile uh, operator will send also your number to the websites, not to all the websites, but only a few that uh, have partnered with mobile operators. And basically, next slide, please. Uh, nobody uh, is aware of that, or at least to my knowledge. In their pri privacy policy, there is nothing explained about this. So 
uh, I think that this is a problem. Next uh, slide, please. It's a problem about uh, net neutrality because somebody's maybe doing something with your connection is a problem about privacy because your phone number is something like a super cookie. And uh, I see no awareness of this problem. So next, please. Uh, we are um, going to have a session about this problem tomorrow at La Quadrature du Net. And uh, if you think that this is a problem, you know that something is happening uh, like this uh, in your uh, country, please uh, join us uh, and uh, Let's talk about this. Thank you. Oh, speak up, uh, speak up, and then they will repeat. So in Switzerland, the same is happening. Spider, which does it, but you can opt out if you want to. Okay. So just to repeat, Swisscom in Switzerland does the same thing, but you can opt out. But it's. Uh, uh, the awareness of this is, n or just because you are uh, a tech, you know that? Uh, I only know it because a colleague of mine noticed that the header was sent out in an HTTP request. So they don't openly talk about it. Okay, thank you. Another question? No? Then thank you very much. Thank you to you. Next up will be Anus talking about QT Pass. Uh, well, first apologies because I was uh, camp is way too exciting to make slides, so I didn't really make slides. Um, anyway, passwords. Uh, everybody uses passwords for every server, site, whatever. A different complex password, right? So people use password managers, and most people I've asked either use LastPass or KeePass, and. Uh, well, LastPass is in the cloud, so who knows? Um, KeePass uh, uses a single master key, so when you share your passwords, you have big problems like corruption, one single master password sucks. Um, all the other people who say they don't use password managers, most of them are lying or just forgot that they actually save their stuff in the browser, so Mozilla, Google, whatever. You can't do that with Teams, it doesn't work. So. A solution, Pass, the standard Unix password manager. It's just a bunch of bash scripts using GPG, Tree, PWGen, um, and Git. Uh, and it's pretty nice. You have a tree of your product, uh, projects, uh, services, whatever, and can store these passwords, GPG encrypted, very nice. Uh, you have tab completion. You can use Git to uh, backup, to share. Um, you can set for whom to encrypt per project, per folder. Very nice. Only problem, CLI. It, it only works in the terminal, so managers can't use it. Eh. So I was working for, uh, with a company last year, uh, just over a year ago, and it is a design company, uh, a branding company, working for many, many different uh, clients. So we had this folder structure on a Samba share with passwords included. So you have your designs, you have your contracts, and your passwords in a Samba share. Mm, can't go that way. So in comes Pass. Developers love it. Everybody loves it, but ah, managers can't work in the CLI. So I was thinking um, one day, sitting at the hackerspace, and thinking, yeah, let's fix this. So I took Qt, which is a nice uh, GUI framework, uh, and in C++, I coded a simple app called QtPass, which was read-only. Can you go next slide? Um, anyways. Ah, yeah. Uh, so it was read-only at first, and I sent on August uh, 1st last year an email to the passwordstore.org mailing list. And um, I thought that was it. Then all of a sudden, up comes... Uh, Easter, I get some pull requests, someone edit, uh, editing, editing and very rudimentary basic user uh, configuration per folder. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that was pretty nice and I got excited again, did some polishing like filtering, um, quick search, uh, templating, 
whatever. And with that enthusiasm, I thought, let's do a release party. So August this year, August 1st, we had a release party. During that release party, some people did a German translation, Hungarian translation, simplified Chinese translation. And, um, well, that makes QT Pass one of the easiest and fully uh, multi-platform systems because Pass doesn't work on Windows. Yeah, it might with SigWin or eh. And QT Pass does all the stuff that Pass itself does uh, in a basic way in the GUI. And ta-da, you have a uh, multi-platform Unix standards um, password manager. Any questions? Whoa. <laughs> no questions? Then thank you very much. Ah, there. OK. Uh, sorry, yes, it does. Uh, it works on the Migo. It works on Android, but the interface needs a lot of love. So if anyone wants to help, uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, GitHub.com slash IHEC slash QtPass um, can also be found on QtPass.org. The interface needs a bit of love, but it works on iOS and Android, uh, Migo, and I think also, or, but not tested, on uh, Sailfish. Another question? Yes, they are behind. Uh, GPG. Uh, the password generation function, ah, uh, it's, um, it has a fallback if you don't have PWGen, that's just a string you can enter in the configuration screen with the different uh, letters, so we have ABC, uh, capitals and small, uh, and uh, numbers and symbols, and it just takes the, a random one for the length you want using the systems random function. So, meh. <laughs> Thank you, Anus. Next up will be Mitro talking about having too many projects. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tim. Next slide. Um, and I have too many projects. And you've kind of gone to the next slide too fast. Um, you also have an old version of my slides. Uh, this is going to be interesting. Um, there are a lot of things that I do, and I would like help on them because um, I need to sleep. Um, next slide. Um, the first thing is, um, yes, you have a very old version of my slides. Um, the first thing is I do a lot of AV stuff, and everybody seems to make the same problems with their slides. So I created a tool to help you. It doesn't help you with the content, but at least it will help you um, make your slides better. Next slide. Um, there's a command line interface. It looks like your standard lint tool. Next slide. Um, there's also a website which you can go to. Next slide. Um, it has a um, generation and it will do PDFs. Next slide. Um, help out. These are the websites. Um, if you go to GitHub, Tim Videos, um, slide lint, that will get you it. Next slide. Um, these are some of the things we could use help with. Next slide. Um, Tim's video is a overview project that um, has um, multiple different things to do with AV involved with it. Um, you can get to it by going to code.timvideos.us. Next slide. Um, this is a diagram of what it takes to do live event streaming at something like um, uh, the CCC, um, we're trying to make it so that anybody can do this without being as smart and awesome as the CC guys are. Next slide. Um, so the first part of this is we are trying to build a um, capture hardware because all the commercial solutions aren't very good and we can't fix them because they're all proprietary. Um, so we developed this thing called the HDMI to USB, which you can get at HDMI to USB.tv. Um, next slide. Um, it's a, based around FPGA and has a VHDL Verilog um, based firmware, but we also have a new firmware based on the stuff that the Milky Mist guys and the MLab guys developed. 
Next slide. Um, there should be a bunch of stuff announcing about the fact that we have some new hardware available that you can buy now um, called uh, the Numantu um, Opsys. If you go to bit.ly get Opsys, that's um, uh, O-P-S-I-S, you can uh, find it there. The complete schematic, PCB, um, design, issues are all there on GitHub. Um, it's got two HDMI inputs, two HDMI outputs, DisplayPort in, DisplayPort out. Um, it's kind of the ideal capture solution um, we want for doing conferences. Um, once you've got that, um, you then need a mixing system. So that's GST switch. It's a software-based HD mixer based on uh, GStreamer. Um, it, we are looking at maybe working with um, the C3 guys here to replace it with Voctomix. Next slide. Um, we also have a streaming system, which is Python and Django, and based around Flumotion. Next slide. Um, that also needs help. Um, next slide. Um, there are other important projects that you should know about um, that aren't related to video streaming. Next slide. One of them is if you use dates in Python, you should be using my Python date time TZ module because you'll get time zones right then um, rather than getting it wrong all the time. Um, I'd highly recommend you um, use this. Next slide. Um, well, my slides are kind of broken. Um, there's also a project called Q. Q is quick and easy debugging. Um, it's really, really horrible hack but it allows you to import Q, and then you put Q where you want to print something, and it writes to the log file. You at Q a um, function, and it will log the decorators. You at Q a class, and it will log all the function calls. Very easy way to debug it when it's 2 AM in the morning, and you don't want to um, get out real tools. Anyway, that is a bunch of my projects. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. Next up will be Christians talking about Z-Wave, whatever that might be. Hello. Uh, yep. Hello. Uh, I would like to um, tell you a few words about Z-Wave. Uh, so, Next slide, please. Z-Wave is a home automation protocol. It is made to control uh, lights, uh, thermostats, and uh, door locks, and get uh, different information from sensors. So it can make your, smart ho your home smart. Uh, and uh, technically, it is um, a wireless protocol with IS in ISM band, uh, 868, 869 megahertz, and it's frequency shift modulation and um, uh, non-return to zero encoding, different channels, etc. And um, uh, the Z-Wave protocol is defined from the very bottom physical layer up to uh, application layer, so it's uh, uh, defined in all seven layers. And um, out of the box, you get a two-way communication. Uh, and the mesh networking. That means that different devices can help others, other devices in your network to route um, the packet if you cannot get it in direct range. Uh, and uh, also there, there is a security encryption, pretty strong encryption that uh, makes your life secure. Uh, the most important uh, for uh, you is that uh, two bottom layers uh, of uh, physical and Mac of that specification is even open and it's defined by ITU G9959. It's written on, as written on the slide. And uh, you can get it from ITU website. Uh, and it's designed to run on a s uh, system on a chip uh, environment. Uh, and uh, basically it works with software defined radio. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what Z-Wave is commercially? It's one of uh, about 30 different smart home wireless solutions um, commonly used. Uh, according to Black Hat, um, it's about, uh, in 2013, it was about 80% uh, percent of the market of residential smart homes. So it's pretty uh, famous. 
Uh, and there are more than 1,400 devices uh, manufactured, uh, not, not manufactured, but different, different types of devices existing worldwide, and uh, more than 300 uh, manufacturers uh, doing all these devices from US to China. Uh, and uh, there are huge vendors using Z-Wave uh, protocol in their devices like uh, Danfoss, Honeywell, and uh, there are solutions from AT&T, and uh, smaller um, like Fibaro and uh, even Samsung sm smart things. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so to play a little bit with Z-Wave, yeah, Z-Wave is a complete solution, so you can just go to the shop and buy some devices, but uh, you also want to play with it. So. Um, uh, there are several uh, possibilities to play. First of all, you want to make a controller that controls different devices in your network. Uh, you can start with using uh, a Raspberry project uh, like a controller. There is a link on the, uh, on the slide that allows you to customize your controller, make your own UI, control different devices, and make some logics. Uh, you can also create your own devices if you are not satisfied the, with those on the market. And for this, you can go with um, a special development board that looks pretty like Arduino, where you can make your own device, program them, and uh, uh, include them in the network. And finally, you all have a radio batch. I forgot mine. <laughs> and uh, you can control uh, from that radio badge, you can reprogram it to use the uh, software-defined radio to control um, Z-Wave devices directly from your badge. This is probably the most interesting challenge you, you should accept. Next, please. Uh, so uh, where to find more information? Where uh, in the works, uh, Workshop center number two, where we can help you to get introduced in uh, Z-Wave and uh, uh, SDR. And um, uh, the tent, uh, the white tent nearby is 24 by 7 available, so just come and uh, ask questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Christians, any questions for him? There is one person. Yes, please. Yeah, we have two audience microphones. If you could just step out and go to the microphone and repeat your question, that would be very cool. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, what is the state uh, of the open source implementation for CD, C, C the Wave? Um, unfortunately, there are no open source implementation of Z-Wave, but uh, you can contribute to make your own. Uh, Z-Wave, it's open uh, in the lowest layer, Mac and Phi, and there are some implementations of upper layer, but in the middle, the routing, all that stuff is still closed, so we need to contribute to make it open. Thank you very much. So now we have two more lightning talks coming up. The first was going to be a musical piece uh, played on, no, I just been told there's no musical piece today. So uh, there's only one more thing coming and that will be Carl Voigt uh, talking about Emacs. Is he here? Are you? Uh, and he'll need to uh, just connect his computer. Don't run away, Vim users, it's for you. That looks like Emacs. Great. Uh, I have a word I have beforehand. This is not my hardware. This is not my keyboard shortcut. So uh, don't be too angry if, if I do something wrong. <laughs> OK. Is this full screen? Is this full screen? Yeah. OK. OK. 
So this is a talk about Emacs, and especially Emacs org mode, which is an extension of the Emacs editor. So just ignore that Emacs is an editor because it isn't. It's, a, it's an operating system and that's not the joke. So I use Emacs org mode to organize my life, my digital life, very, very, very intense. I care about personal information management. And this is just a short example how I do things. Uh, I tried to come up with an example. Uh, you see, you see it here uh, as a trip to the CCC camp 2015. And here you see, oh, I have to admit, I have to say, uh, all you see is text. It's just text. So the color and underlining and whatsoever is added by interpretation of Emacs. It's just highlighting, syntax highlighting, okay? So I've got uh, five, five headings here. The first one is a uh, heading to pack things. And you notice that it's, uh, I can uh, expand it. Uh, so I see into the pack things heading and you see it's a list. Oops. It's a, it's a simple list. And uh, with the keyboard shortcut, I can uh, mark it, mark lines as done, not as done. Uh, and you see when any sub items get marked as done, then the uh, previous uh, heading gets marked as done as well. Um, here as well. I can change the order by keyboard shortcuts. You see, I can move this item or I can move this in and out and so forth. So it's pretty easy to do stuff with this. When I finish packing things, I mark this as done. And because I uh, ha have some rules in there, for example, the, the trigger line to Miltenberg, it's another ID that gets uh, marked as to do. So then I have to load the car. I mark this is done as well. Then let's drive to Miltenberg. Oops. Done as well. So you see, you can, you can define dependencies. So um, when I have here a dependency, for example, uh, loading the car is blocked by packing stuff. So as long as I did not finish um, uh, packing things, I cannot finish load car. And this is quite especially because when I schedule to-dos, they don't appear on my calendar as long as they are blocked. So my calendar, it's called a agenda. My agenda is only uh, full with items I can do now. And whenever I, I, I accomplish a, a heading and mark it as done, other items get as marked as to be done and unblocked, and they appear on my calendar as well, on my agenda. So it's, it's quite handy, and this was, this was the killer feature for me to start with Emacs org mode in the first place. And of course, uh, I can only show here a, a tiny, tiny, tiny small fraction of what org mode can, can do for you. But I guess to-do list is very basic, so anybody of you, everybody of you can, can uh, do to-do lists with it. Okay, the next one is quite special and administration is uh, quite time consuming when you have to um, lock your, the stuff you're doing. So next thing I want to show is you can integrate program code into Emacs org mode. Here's an example where I integrated a shell script. Okay, let's, whoops. Let's delete this here. I integrated a shell script, which is just a one-liner, disk-free. And when I execute it, <laughs> okay, sorry, not my system. Um, if I would have executed it on my computer, <laughs> this is the result for my computer. And you see, uh, it recognizes the output as a table. And then, if I want to, I can use columns or even uh, single uh, values of this uh, table to produce other stuff. So I can use this table as an input for a Perl script, for a Python script. I can do R visual visualization. Um, here I, I don't want to execute it because it's not my setup and therefore it breaks. Um, I use the output of a disk use command with a grep, you see it up, up there, uh, and I generate a table, and 
I'm, I'm so, so afraid I cannot do this. I, I generate a pie chart of my disk usage in the next step. Obviously, I cannot execute it on this computer because it's not set up with R and Emacs. Okay, so you might get a small, small, small impression of what, how capable this, this stuff is going to do. So, for example, if you're administrator of, of, uh, of numerous uh, Linux systems, you can use sessions. So you define a session to a remote computer, you execute commands, you get the results, the standard output, if you want the standard error as well, into your documentation right there. You can add documentation in between, and then the next block, you can, uh, you, you can use the previous environment to send another command, and so forth. So it's very, very awesome. So, next thing uh, the, the org mode is capable of is full-blown spreadsheets. So this is an example where I collect some uh, expanses of, of this trip. You see, uh, I took the train from Berlin to Mildenberg yesterday, and uh, I about uh, 23 euro, and I did some groceries. And as you see, uh, at the end of this line, there is a sum. So you can all sorts of computation. You can do statistical analysis whatsoever. And uh, in the next table, you see um, two families joining here at the camp, the Smiths and the Petersons. The Smiths are two persons, the Petersons are three persons, and I calculated the expan expanse per person. And as you can see in the, in the, in the formula uh, below, it, there's a reference to another uh, table which gets the total uh, number of euros which were being spent and then calculates the amount of euros per person and so forth. So it's, such, it's just a very, very simple, small example. I think you get the idea. So bonus topics. Uh, there is really, really millions, millions of cool features. I, I tend to express org mode like this is a, is a very, very, very big box of Lego bricks, you know, the stuff the kids used to play. And it, whatever you, you bricks you take out of the box and how, however you are combining those bricks, org mode is a great tool for you. It's of course open source, it's a very, very nice community a very active community, and uh, most requirements are already been done or were already been done within this, this project. So, for example, you can use tags, you can use org mode to clock your business hours, and there will be uh, uh, calculations depending on your client and so forth. Um, you can integrate, of course, all kinds of scripting languages. Um, use this output for another input, for another scripting language, so you can in integrate uh, Perl, with Perl, uh, Perl with Python, with R, with whatever you like. Uh, researching is quite cool with it. I did some work on this as well. So for reproducibility, you can, uh, for example, have uh, uh, three CVS files with raw data from an experiment. Then you have one single org mode file. And when you compile this org mode file to a PDF, I cannot show you the PDF export here in this setup, unfortunately, but just a, 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 a keyboard shortcut and you, you see the PDF version of, of this file. Um, of course, nicely linked and so forth. I have a couple more uh, minutes more than the others because it's not my machine, yeah. <laughs> minutes and we gave you an extension. <laughs> yeah, please come to a conclusion soon. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm already at the end. So, uh, one, one org mode file, uh, you uh, compile it. You and can you ask get for an extension. You can ask the audience for an extension. Do you want to give him oh, an extension hey. of two minutes? Okay. Um, I hope you sit well because um, it's, it's mind blowing. Three uh, raw data files, one text file, one org mode file, uh, with documentation, with comments. Uh, with, of course, uh, scripts like this, with Python, with R, whatever you like, uh, and one single keyboard shortcut, and you get the full-blown ACM format PDF file out of it. And it's completely clear what the author did with the raw data until the final product, including diagrams whatsoever. 
So it's really, really, really amazing. Even, even for you yourself, because you don't forget how you generated this or that diagram. And if the basic data changes, you just have to type one single keyboard shortcut and the whole paper and every derived data is recalculated again. So you can, of course, use it for project management. You can export gent charts uh, and much, much more. Unfortunately, you have only very short time here. So uh, there is a lot of folks out there doing Emacs org mode. The Emacs org mode URL is above there. So org mode.org. Uh -huh. uh, easy to remember. And if you want to follow me, because I'm very, very fanatic freak about personal information management, not only Emacs org mode related, uh, you find me on Twitter. I've got a blog, of course, a self-written blog directly from org mode to my website. Uh, I have all my source code being published at GitHub, including many, many extensions for Emacs org mode. Because I am not, my, my brain is incompatible with Emacs Lisp. Uh, I had to do it with Python. So if you're not a Lisp person, no worries. Emacs is right the tool for you. Um, OK. And if I get requests, I can upload this as a, a GitHub repository as well. It's just a text file. OK. <laughs> Are there any questions? Where is the whim? Where is the whim? Uh, I, I'm a Wim user. I am a, a formerly, I'm a, a everyday Wim user. So I write my emails with Wim. I uh, uh, I write configuration files with Wim. So I know Wim very well. But when I saw org mode, an org mode demo, right from the start, I installed Emacs again and began to learn org mode. So you can still use Wim wherever and whatever and for whatever you want, but please use Emacs org mode to, to organize your digital life because there is nothing better than this. And trust me, I've tried everything. Thank you very much for your very enthusiastic talk about Emacs org mode. <laughs>